In this movie, we'll look at how you generate a model. Now I know we actually generated a model back in the last chapter when we were working with migrations. We generated both the model and the migration at the same time. But back then we were really focused on the migration side of things. And now we need to take a closer look at the model side because there are a couple of important points that you need to understand. To review, the command that you use from the command line to generate the model is rails generate model and then the singular name of the model in camel case. So for example, subject. This results in the creation of two important files. The first is our migration file, which is in db migrate. We saw earlier that that file was named with the timestamp, followed by create subjects. If we open that file up, there's a definition for a Ruby class in there called create subjects, which inherits from active record migration, right? The part of active record that knows about migrations. We also saw that that file gets pre-populated with a couple of method calls to create table and drop table, both for the table named subjects. At the same time as it does that, it also creates a file in app models, which is called subject.rb, singular. If we open that up, there's a Ruby class in there called subject, and subject inherits from active record base. So the reason that I wanted to run through the list of how things are named with you is because file names, class names, and table names are significant in Ruby on Rails. It's part of the convention over configuration. If we stick with naming things in the way that Rails wants us to, then Rails can find things without us having to explicitly tell it where to find them. For example, if we suddenly say, hey Rails, I want to use my subject class. And Rails says, oh, I don't know about that subject class. Where can I find it? Well, guess what? It knows that it can find it inside app, inside models, inside a file called subject.rb. That's where it expects the subject class to be defined. And then if we say, oh, subject class, go to the database and retrieve something for me, the subject says, because I'm an active record class, I already know how to go to the database, and I'm expecting there to be a table there called subjects, the plural of my class name. Now again, we can configure all of those things, but it speeds things up if we can work with Rails conventions. The second point I want to make is that the Rails generate command isn't doing anything magical for you. All it's doing is creating files with everything named according to Rails conventions. So the names are all sorted out for you from the beginning. But that's all it's doing. You could actually create these same files from scratch, and as long as you followed Rails naming conventions, it would have the exact same result. So I just want to demystify that. I don't want you to think that that Rails generate command is doing anything magical. It's just doing something very helpful. Let's take a look now at the models we already created. So inside our application, inside the app folder, inside models is where we're always going to find our model definitions. We want them always to go here. Don't put them anywhere else. They go here in this folder. And we see that we've created four models so far. We did that back in the last chapter. User.rb was one that I created with you. And then in the assignment that I had you do at the end of the chapter, you created subject, page, and section. Let's open up user.rb. So you can see it's just a simple Ruby class called user. That's it. The class inherits from active record base. So just the main portion of active record as opposed to some of the other things that active record knows how to do. What this is saying is, hey, I want to create a new class and I want it to behave with all of the default configurations that are built into Rails. I want it to know how to interact with the database and I want it to have all these wonderful features right out of the box. So just by adding this one little line with active record base, our models become database turbocharged. Now you could just as easily have a class like this that didn't connect to the database, right? We could go ahead and write our own class and we could make use of it exactly like a Ruby class. It's still a model, it's just not an active record model anymore. So most times you're going to be using active record models, but if you needed to write other Ruby classes, you can go ahead and write those and put them in your model folder. You don't need to use the generate command or anything, you can just create a file. Again, there's nothing magical about that generate command. Now as you can see, my class name does match my file name. So that's good, they need to match. But if we go back over here and we look at the migrations that we ran, we ran a migration called alter users. We've originally created the table as users, that's when we did the generate, that's when the model was created. But then in our alter users migration, we renamed the table to be admin users. So what this means is that we've now gone against Rails conventions. By default, it's gonna be looking for a table called users it won't find it, it'll object, it'll say, I don't find users. Meanwhile, all our data is sitting in another table called admin users. So there's two possible solutions to this. The first is that we can actually call an active record method, a method built into active record. We now have the use of it. It's called set table name. So we make that method call set table name equal to 
whatever our table name is. And that will configure it to use this different table name. Problem solved, right? We went against Rails conventions, but we just configured it to do something different. This is very useful if you have a legacy database you're trying to connect to. You could have a completely crazy table name and still use Rails with it just by providing a little bit of configuration. Instead of doing this though, I'm going to use Rails configurations instead, which means that I have to say that the class is going to be admin user. Now admin user will expect to find a table called admin users. And of course if I change the class name, then I also need to go here and change the file name as well. Those have to match. So there we are, admin user. Now it's going to know how to find it. All of Rails conventions will take place. I didn't have to do any configuration. I want to open up adminuser.rb and point out something else to you, which is that one of the wonderful things that we inherit from Active Record Base is that Active Record Base is able to look at the table for admin users and it knows what the table looks like. It knows what columns exist in the table. So whereas in Ruby, we would have to actually write out methods that would allow us to access the value for first name, so attribute accessor, or doing that same thing but writing it out long form, we would have a reader method and a writer method for last name. Instead of having to do this for each and every one of our attributes, all we have to do is inherit from active record and boom, just like that, it knows about first name, it knows about last name, it knows about username. If we add a new column to the field, if we change the name of a column, all we have to do is restart our application and Active Record once again knows, oh, you've changed the name from password to hashed password. Once again, it's just another place where Rails helps save you time while you're developing and helps you to write less code, which could potentially break later on.